Okay, I, let's get started. Um, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Doug Perkins. I am Associate Director for Operations and Finance at the Middlebury College Museum of Art and a member of the NEMA board. And I am just sort of hanging out in the background, making sure everything goes smoothly on this session. A um, couple pieces of housekeeping. Um, you'll notice that uh, the chat has the chat and the Q and A functions had been disabled for Zoom. Um, this is something that Neem had to do system wide. Um, so all of the chat and and Q and A functions need to happen in the Whova app. Um, so please go there for for that. Um, and additionally, sessions are not allowed to run over because we need to repurpose the channel to get the next session started. Um, but once the session ends, the, the uh, Q&A and the chat will still be available, of course, I've been told anyway, still be available via Whova. Okay. With that, uh, I turn it over to the presenters to get started. Excellent. Cool. Well, we'll get moving. Um, so actually, I just invented this right now. Um, so if anybody has any questions or they want to keep talking like after this or keep discussing these different ideas, um, like new things to build, um, let's do hashtag NEMA, N-E-M-A, what now? Uh, so we can sort of keep that conversation going because I, I know it's a little clunky on Google sometimes. Anyways, hey, how's it going? Uh, my name is Kellyanne and, uh, and I will be your, your stewardess for this session today. I brought on six of my favorite immersive designers um, to talk to you guys all about um, what we're doing sort of in the new normal. Uh, so, you know, what's happening in the world of immersive, interactive games and creative uh, because people are really building some really unique and unusual things and uh, I work both with museums and with games and I thought you guys would really love to know more about what people are building. Um, so do you guys want to do a quick run once around and you can sort of give the elevator pitch of what you're working on and then we'll delve into it? Yeah, sound good. All right, let's start with Jess. Hey folks, uh, my name is Jessica Crean and I run a game and immersive experience studio called I Can't Go On. And so I'm working on both of those things right now and usually at the same time. So lots of games, lots of immersive experiences. Excellent. Shelly? I'm Shelly Reeves and I am the founding director of a virtual African-American museum called Reframe History. So I'm working on a Black History app and we just opened an exhibition recently. So working on some cool interactives with that too. All right, uh, Sai? Hi everyone, um, I'm Sai Wise. I am the founder and live raccoon of a VR studio called Absurd Joy. Um, and we are currently in a year long uh, prototype of various uh, game mechanics and um, uh, interactions for uh, native VR. Awesome. Um, and Kermisha? Hey everyone, I'm Karamisha Reeb. I am the owner of Mission 57 Escape Room out in Monterey, California. And currently I'm working on an outdoor scavenger hunt as well as um, some other products like mobile escape games to bring the fun to you since no one can really hang outside these days. Excellent. And last but not least, Kiera. Hi everyone, my name is Kiara Vincent and I am part of the Reframe History team with Shelley Reeves. I am working on the interactive component of the VR museum and I'm glad to be here today. Excellent. All right. Well, I'm going to get us kicked off. The big plan is um, we are going to walk through uh, what we're working on right now. So we're going to start a little bit with like what we were doing before, uh, what we're doing now, and sort of where we see things going um, in the next you know, six months to a year. Uh, we're all going to spend maybe five to seven minutes chatting about our work, and then together we're going to talk about the things that we love to talk about, um, because we're, we're all designers and friends and just love to sort of shoot ideas around and, and chat. Um, but we would love to hear more from you guys as well, so please put information in the chat. I'll do my best to follow it. Um, also put a uh, questions in there. We see we've got two questions in there already, which is amazing. We're going to make sure that we get to that. So like put in as much stuff as you possibly can, because this is like our favorite thing to talk about. So, all right, I'm going to try to share my screen. So let me know if it's working, guys. Like, Because it's one of those weird things with the Zoom where it's like, you think it looks okay. What do you think? Can you see everything? Beautiful. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. All right. And you can all hear me okay, right? Yes. Yeah, okay, awesome. All right, so I'm gonna start us off with five minutes on what now? Six interactive designers share their new normal toolkits. 
So first, oh, wait a second. It's not going to, oh, there we go. Okay, that's how I'm gonna do that. Um, how do we create together now? So as we were talking about what we do, because all six of us have different specializations, but we have a common theme. And I think the theme for all of us is how to build things that connect people. And typically we're used to doing that in a physical environment but now things are different. Uh, I don't think any of us would really describe ourselves as video game designers or video content designers. Um, Sai is the closest because she does virtual reality, but in fact, I don't know if that's really a, a video game either, you know, because she'll talk a little bit later uh, about how that's also about like connecting people in physical spaces. Um, yeah, so we, we thought we would spend some time and share with you sort of what we're working on. I'm gonna go first because I do an awful lot of work with games, immersive experiences, and museums. Um, I am a self-professed museum. -y. I've been doing this for about 12 years now. Um, I worked with another company that did work with museums um, before I started Green Door Labs in 2012. And I had to go through this and make sure that I wasn't making it up. But in the last um, eight years, I've actually built 132 games with uh, museums, libraries, and nonprofits. And we've created seven immersive productions and the way that my little indie studio stays alive is the trifecta of these sort of independent ticketed immersive experiences um, things that I sort of do on my own but which always have a historical bent because I can just never get away from that um, I've got software the adventure builder which I build a lot of stuff with university libraries but also do stuff with museums and building some stuff with the old North church right now we rent something with the USS Constitution Museum over the summertime. So there's always a little something happening with the Adventure Builder. Um, and then I do a lot of custom game designs with museums. So I have built games for everybody from you know, the Smithsonian to the Peabody Essex, the Boston Children's Museum. We've built all sorts of really wonderful things. Um, so previously, 2019, um, really our, our audiences were growing. Uh, Club Drosselmeyer sold 750 tickets, which in Boston, I, I just think that that was nothing short of a miracle because getting people out is really a challenge. Um, Night Cafe was our seventh full-scale production since 2016, and we were just building some really, really fun stuff for museums. Uh, escape rooms and boxes, um, sort of in-gallery uh, interactives. Uh, we built some stuff with the Detroit Institute of Arts that were these sort of um, in-gallery in physical games. We just, you know, we have been building really fun stuff. Um, and then 2020 happened and a lot of the things that we did just didn't exist anymore. Um, so like people visiting museums, like as you all know, that's just not a thing anymore. Um, using objects and places to tell stories. Um, unless that object is in your house or unless the place is outside, that's going to be difficult to do now. Um, but of course, you know, there was still one thing that people still needed that we still offered with museums and history and culture and art and that's that people always want to connect right people want to connect and they want things to do and they want this content too right you know everybody loves netflix but you know you get sick of it after a while you're like oh great yet another post-apocalyptic teen drama um like what can I look at that has some real content? And that's where we get to work with museums and, and nonprofits and, and really use their content. Um, so I started exploring a new toolkit. And I think it's safe to say that I've been doing something of R&D since April. Um, I, I really like to do sort of rapid prototyping and see what I can build with what I have. And so we're just sort of shooting whatever we possibly could out the door um, because you really just don't know what works until we give it a shot. So here I'll show you a couple of different things that I was working on um, that worked pretty well, I thought. Um, so the first thing that I thought was really interesting was um, April comes and one of my biggest concerns was a lot of my friends are freelancers and they didn't have any work. Their work just like suddenly dried up and we're talking about people being in, unable uh, in April to just meet really basic needs like food and rent. And so I was like, okay, how do I build something fast to get money into my friends? pockets fast. Uh, and the answer ended up being Kickstarter. Um, so we 
created uh, a game, just a simple online game on Kickstarter. And uh, it was uh, something that everybody could sort of get behind. It was the American Society for the Protection of Magical Creatures, um, which I don't know if you guys saw Save the Munbacks, but that was uh, a creation that we made at the Eustace Estate. Um, uh, New England historical and uh, yeah it was just it was it was there it didn't actually connect to their content because it was all magic stuff moral of the story is it was a lot of fun uh, we asked for twenty five hundred dollars we got about sixteen thousand um, which is great so I hired on rather than five friends um, I, I hired 15 um, and this is not unusual either for Kickstarter. Um, you know, a lot of these products for like objects and puzzles are doing really well right now. And these aren't random objects, these are friends, you know? So like, this is Ryan at Labyrinth and this is Rita at Emerald Flame. So these are, you know, just friends who've been building puzzling adventures for a long time. And now um, people are really hungry for this type of content. They're doing extraordinarily well on Kickstarter. So I was like, okay, Kickstarter is a thing. Um, but it's not always a thing <laughs> because I have a yearly adventure called Drosselmeyer and I was like, okay, I don't know if I'm going to be able to fund this version of Club Drosselmeyer. Um, I'm going to go on to Kickstarter and see if I can do it. The, the full overhead for it was 35000 That's about what it costs to build this particular game. Um, and uh, so we went on to Kickstarter to see if we could do it, and we came up short. It was just, it was too much money. We still raised $19,000, which is a huge amount of money, but, you know, we were asking for the wrong number. Um, but we kept going, you know, we, we built um, online puzzle hunts, really simple, simple things where you can just create puzzles and people can solve them. They can buy them online. Um, a good artist is worth their weight in gold, made all the difference. Uh, we built things off of Squarespace, you know, so it was just a simple way to create this interactive content. Um, low barrier to entry, something where we could fail quickly if it didn't work and you just take it down rather than hard coding everything for a lot of overhead. Uh, we built a lot of things with video in it. So um, a lot of talented friends who are totally willing to do all these crazy videos, made things super engaging, um, made the content much more fun. And this is just people who are filming these simple scripts, um, wearing a costume with their iPhone at home. It really increased the, the production value of what we were building. Um, Club Drosselmeyer this year, we decided to do it with audio. We created a radio adventure because I was sick of staring at Zoom and I suspect that you are too. So we wanted one more interactive that did not use Zoom. We didn't want everybody looking at the screen. Um, so we created an interactive audio adventure um, and we decided that we were going to build boxes with our interactive audio adventure. Um, so we've been learning how to manufacture things. Um, I'd never really done that before, um, but we created things like pins and uh, decoder documents and custom boxes and rulers and, you know, we're pr producing all of these things and mailing them to people, things we've never tried before. Um, new tech innovations. Um, we created a whole system uh, to, to build Club Drosselmeyer off of. So uh, we call it Telefun. And luckily, I have a very clever husband who just thought this looked like fun. We created a choose your own adventure telephone system uh, that interacts with the audio adventure uh, that, that you're doing. Um, I started doing consulting. I've never done consulting before. Uh, typically, people hire me to complete a project, but I realized that not everybody needs the project completed. Sometimes they just need to get the design done and, and be able to set their agenda and create a schedule. And uh, yeah, and this was sort of a skill set that it just never occurred to me that I had or that people would want. Um, my predictions for the future. Um, so I think it's going to be a while before people are going to be willing to go to public places, obviously. Um, but museums like us are going to learn all sorts of new ways to tell their stories. You know, they're going to do audio, they're going to do video, they're going to do games, they're going to try every possible thing. And I think with reduced educational budgets, they're going to find ways to do more with less. Um, I think they're going to try and find new funding models. Um, I think the, the sort of standard uh, 
uh, grants are going to be gobbled up by more dire looking projects. Um, and as we've all seen, education just kind of falling to the wayside in the priorities in most museums. So we're gonna have to find new creative ways to fund the things that we're doing. Um, but one thing that I have found is that people, I think will always want connections and things to do. I don't think that's something that's gonna stop. So as long as we can listen carefully to our users and try and figure out what it is that they need, um, then we can try and innovate and find ways to get them there. Um, so that said, I am going to pass the baton, so to speak, on to Karnisha. I'm gonna stop my share. Karnisha, you're on. Hello, okay, I'm gonna start my share. Let's see, sharing. Okay, can you guys see everything? Yep, I can Perfect. see everything. Awesome, so this is what we're gonna talk about today, guys. Escape rooms in the age of COVID. Things are definitely a little different than they used to be. Um, I'm going to introduce myself, talk about the before times, what's going on now, and where we go from here. Notice that purple letter. You might want to make a note of that. I love sneaking puzzles everywhere. And yes, this is obviously one of them. So keep track. Okay, so who am I? Karmisha. I'm an Air Force veteran, sci-fi nerd, um, single mom's single mom of teens, that makes me crazy just by itself, and a maker. Um, if I had to really categorize my military service, it was about military exercises and teamwork. So I really think those two things just fit perfectly uh, within the escape room industry and just let me create crazy scenarios that teams complete. Um, and I've just I've been loving it so much. My business, Mission 57 Escape Room, has been open for two years now. Um, and things were going really well <laughs> until COVID happened. Um, but we'll dive into that a little bit later. Okay, so the before times, right? In the old days, when you wanted to play an escape game, you'd book online, you'd show up to play, take your picture, and then go home, right? Really simple. Um, but obviously COVID came and things changed. Um, so this is uh, pictures of my two escape games, Cabin Heist and Video Store. And this is what it was like every day. A bunch of people, most of the time, I'd say 90% of the time, same families or coworkers from an office, uh, just in a group, in a room, close quarters, searching around for clues, having a great time at the end. But alas, um, things change. So in the beginning, we were looking at just in-person escape games. However, people, owners had to adapt to the situation and we started to see more puzzle hunts. Now, scavenger hunts, puzzle hunts, they were offered previously, um, but I'd say there was, there's more of an emphasis on this option now because scavenger hunts can and puzzle hunts can be done outside where they're a little more safer. But we're also seeing puzzle hunts online, which is a cool new twist to that concept. Same with take home games. Again, expanded sort of just conceptions of what an escape game could be. Oh, well now on Etsy, you'll find a bunch of little take home boxes that you can order online, play them with your family one time use. Other escape game companies are doing really fancy boxes um, with an entire escape game inside that you can rent and return to the location when you're done with it. So just lots of creativity happening right now. We're seeing some online self-paced games. These are usually accomplished using Google Forms. Um, I believe somebody asked in one of the Q&As already, what sort of platforms might you use um, for some games? And I think Google Forms is a great free opportunity um, to create educational and entertainment products easily and cheaply. Um, and last but not least, sort of the biggest development is virtual games with avatars, right? So 
it used to be that when we thought of an escape room, we only thought that you needed to be inside a physical space. However, owners have been just trying new things and we came up with the avatar model and it's really amazing. Basically the avatar or the owner or escape room staff is in the escape room. Players join via Zoom and they direct the avatar. And there's usually a camera person that can sort of aim the camera at the puzzles and around the room as you guide them to do. Um, and you solve the puzzle that way. And it seems like that might be a terrible way to play an escape game, but it actually is a lot of fun. People are very creative in making these events, these experience, just a really fun way to connect with your friends and family. So let's talk about the future then. Going forward, what can we expect to see? Definitely a lot more of this, definitely a lot more virtual games. Um, even the innovation that we've seen from day one of the shutdown. So virtual games in March look nothing like the virtual games we're seeing now in November, just because the creativity and the technology, all of these things have really transformed over time to make an even more amazing virtual escape game experience. So as people see, as other owners see the success that these first movers, if you will, have experienced with these virtual games. We're seeing more people say, oh, okay, well, how can I make my game virtual? How can I get some income coming in during this time when maybe my physical store is closed? So I just wanted to highlight some of the really great virtual games that are out there right now. Um, the Exorcist game is actually in the UK. It is a scary game, but super fun. They actually said 90% of their customers are US based. Um, so when we're playing the game at two o'clock and four o'clock at our time, I'm in California, so PST, it's actually midnight and one o'clock and two o'clock in Britain. So that's another thing that having these virtual games now actually allows us to expand our reach and our customer base in ways that we never thought that we would be able to do, right? I certainly never thought I would go to England to play an escape game, but I've played several of them just from home during the shutdown. The truth about Edith, great game, lots of fun for people who love cats. Um, they really emphasize the collaborative nature um, of virtual escape games. You would think because you're on Zoom, maybe you can't work together to solve a puzzle, but they have come up with some great technology that allows everyone to have a part in manipulating puzzles and solving them and just a great experience. And I have to get a shout out to Ready Mayor One because he is legendary for creating a virtual Zoom game in which if you click something on a web page that he gives you the link to, it actually affects things in the room. And that's just an awesome experience. And I suggest you guys check out any of these games if you ever have the time. Um, also, I'm seeing a lot of virtual games and simple escape rooms being hosted by museums and libraries. The one I see all the time is definitely Hogwarts as a Harry Potter fan. Maybe I'm just always looking for that one. Um, but they're super easy to build with free software, keeps everyone engaged. And like I mentioned before, they can educate and entertain. So as far as my company specifically, Mission 57, we're definitely diversifying our offerings. Um, I spent so many of the early months of the shutdown just on the couch thinking, ah, my life is over, escape rooms are canceled. Um, but this whole opportunity has just made me realize that there are so many other ways of playing and having fun with your friends and family that don't need to happen within inside a closed space. So like I mentioned, I'm working on a puzzle hunt for my own business. It's going to be augmented reality. Really excited about that. Um, looking at doing a mobile escape game, sort of like a bouncy castle. We're just going to bring the escape room to you, play with your friends or your family, and uh, we'll take it away. And also looking at a virtual game, you know, another shutdown is looming. And so just want to have something out there for customers that they can do online. But I thought more about the whole title and theme of this conference. And, you know, I really wanted to answer that question, who am I now? And so, like I said, I was very sad about the loss of my traditional 
avenue for hosting escape games. But during the shutdown, I just realized that there's so much more to the industry. Um, I recently started Rakuni.org, and this whole endeavor is going to be all about just teaching puzzle design to BIPOCs, you know, I really want to get some more diversity into the escape room industry, and I hope to do it through that venture. I've partnered with Coast Connect in Santa Cruz. They are um, having a grand opening for this new rail and trail that's just going to really revolutionize how citizens move around in the city. Now they can have a safe corridor for bikes and walking to get to and from their homes and stores and work. And it's just a project with meaning that I'm really happy to be a part of. So I would say rather than a loss, COVID has really helped me just expand my horizons and open up the aperture so I can see the real possibilities of what puzzles can bring in to people's lives in other areas. Last but not least, sorry to wrap up here, just quick resources, Google Forms, Google Slides, YouTube, all this stuff is free and you are only limited by your imagination. You can create some awesome experiences just using these um, platforms alone. And so I just encourage everyone to give it a shot if it's something that you're interested in. So last but not least, if you were paying attention to those purple letters, you will see desperation breeds innovation. Again, quarantine has changed so many parts of our lives. Um, and we're not quite out of the woods, but it has provided an opportunity to rethink how we've been doing things in the past and hopefully come up with new ways to still get our product, our message, our vision out there and connect with the people who would respond to it. Thanks for your time, you guys. Hey. Awesome. Thanks, Karmisha. Um, I'm so sorry. So I, I swapped you guys just to make things exciting for you. So uh, Sai was supposed to go next. I also just realized that the only way for me to keep you on time is to literally interrupt you and yell at you. Um, so I'm really sorry about that. <laughs> so you'll hear me interrupting you guys and being like, hey, come on, let's go. Um, yeah, so Sai, why don't we have you? Let's yeah, you. sure. Happy uh, to go next. Let me share my screen here. We've all already had shout outs about your live raccoon titles. <laughs> Thank you. We're on board with that. I love that. All right. How are we doing? Are we seeing this? Do we have things? Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, new friends. I am Cy Wise. I am the founder and live raccoon at Absurd Joy, which is an XR studio. Uh, let's see. Who am I? Uh, so me. So I've been a game developer for around 15 years. Most of it has been like in AAA MMOs, but it's also been in single player development. Um, but I jumped into virtual reality in 2015, um, right before the uh, launch of the uh, commercial VR and the most recent iteration, which would have been like the Oculus and the Vive and uh, PlayStation VR. Uh, I previously worked at Alchemy Labs, which made uh, Job Simulator and Rick and Morty Virtual Recality. Um, and there I was a studio head, writer, and an interactions designer. I'm going to say interactions very specifically because a lot of what we do in VR isn't just about interactive design, but it's also about using this weird new technology and figuring out the language and communication physically between the human body and that, and that technology and how they communicate. So a lot of things in terms of like grabbing, manipulating, um, throwing, all of those, um, figuring out how to make those feel really natural and enjoyable and fun. So it gets very nuanced sometimes. Uh, and then Absurd Joy is my studio. It is brand heckin' new. Uh, I started it in uh, October of last year, um, which was going to end up being a very interesting time to start things. Um, we uh, specifically carved out a full year of prototyping, um, and we were looking specifically into um, new genres, new physical interactions, um, and embodied play in XR mediums. Um, so uh, we're very glad that we have carved out that year of prototyping for ourselves. Um, and it's been an interesting journey. The before times. Uh, so originally we were looking into facilitate, facilitating play in shared spaces. We had this idea of XR and VR in specific is known as a very 
uh, isolating medium. Um, you play alone in your house, perhaps in a dark basement. Um, it's not uh, it's not very collaborative. And uh, we really wanted to see how to sort of um, invite people to come together in a shared space uh, and play in VR together. We will see how 2020 shapes up for that uh, in a second. Uh, so this is one of the first things we did. It was a prototype called Big Versus. Um, we did it in a week. Uh, basically, the idea was get eight humans in a shared space playing fa five fast-paced mini games um, using XR technology. Now, one of the things that's really bizarre about XR is that it's new, it's weird, it's clunky. Um, so what we really wanted to do was make experiences that were entirely self-explanatory and incite instant cooperation, just sort of got people picking up and instantly knowing what to do and how to collaborate with each other. Um, I'm going to mention multiple times um, blog posts. We're doing this thing we're calling public prototyping, which is we're trying to share our findings as we're prototyping. Um, so if you have a chance to stop by or are interested in more, you can stop by our blog for this one. Uh, the next thing we did was we did this uh, ex uh, an event called Indie Trash Night, which was a local event here in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, the focus on this was sort of to take g traditional games events and sort of open them up to the community a little bit more um, uh, for both the developers making the experiences and for um, the audiences coming in. So the focus, instead of being on traditional polished games, was on interactive toys um, and sort of more of... Uh, play and not necessarily finished products. The idea was sort of just get something out the door that was interesting and, and fun. Uh, we wanted to encourage game developers to get a little weird and creative and outside their comfort zone, but we also wanted to be inclusive of like the arts community and the music community and the theater community and sort of bring everybody in to experience games and play uh, without the associated gatekeeping that often comes with uh, traditional game dev events. Uh, okay, so now we're in the now times. Uh, it's not quite, uh, shared, shared space isn't, isn't really <laughs> a thing that we're going to be doing a lot in the now times. Um, and we ended up instead sort of pivoting to this idea of meaningful moments in intimate groups. Um, we were really interested in not necessarily connecting with strangers across the internet, but connecting with people who we knew and were close to, and frankly, we're missing a whole lot. Um, so we started building experiences with that sort of demographic uh, in mind. So uh, this was our first experience. It was called Terroir. Basically, the idea was have a little tabletop in which you have um, like a palette of objects that you can place. Um, and then people could place them, build their own clubhouse as in essence, because at that point, once you're done building or even the middle of building, you can teleport into it and look at the space as you've designed it and do fine details and stuff. Um, this was really useful because um, XR is weird and clunky and unnatural. Like the headset is heavy and hot. Um, it feels weird to be strapped into all of this hardware. So we found that having a task that was um, like interesting and deliberate without taking a huge amount of cognitive load, right, was just enough to kind of distract people from the weird hardware, which actually ended up facilitating conversation. So when you have this group building project, um, everyone's focused just enough to forget that they're tethered to a, a PC and can can get to you know more more wholesome conversations about life and this such. This was another one. This was sort of a natural evolution, um, was a boat. Um, this was important for us to do because after Tawar, we noticed that um, there's a lot of discomfort that comes from XR. There's eye strain, colors can be bright. Um, just XR itself can be a really um, and it was a sterile environment. So XR itself, like the experience of being in the space is so important. So we wanted to specifically um, build a comfortable space. So this was um, light and color design. We did a huge pass on that. Um, and also space design to sort of facilitate this coziness. Um, this ended up being our stand-up meeting that we had every single day. We would have it inside the space to make sure that we were using it and, and sort of judging our comfort level as we were building it. So basically dog fooding the experience as we were doing it. And we had meaningful physical interactions again to to hold on to that um that lesson learned of uh just enough to distract yourself from the weirdness of the hardware so we went with um uh marshmallow roasting and uh you'll also see i don't know if you can see there's a little crab uh in there sitting next to beans who uh if you high five the crab he'll run off and bring you a slice of pizza which we found very important at the time 
Okay, so the next thing we did uh, was twine, but in VR. So this was uh, basically using existing uh, VR painting apps, such as uh, uh, like quill and in our case tilt brush was what we used. We basically made an interactive layer that went on top of it that allowed artists to make interaction zones that could link multiple scenes together. So for example, if you had a doorway um, with a with a handle on it, we would basically allow people to put an interactive node over the, the door knob. So when you touched it, it would load the next scene. So this was really important because um, it allowed artists to tell their own stories without uh, any coding. What it would do at the end of this, and here's an example, what it would do at the end is it would allow uh, all the programming to be done on our end. It would just spit out an executable so that so the artists had the ability to tell their own stories, construct their, you know, uh, branching narrative, and then allow people to just go in and, uh, and uh, uh, ex execute their own their own experience. Uh, we immediately made a snake based dating simulator um, because uh, they're adorable and snakes are wonderful, and we just wanted to sit in a cafe with with some sweeties. So that's what we made as our as our trial. And. That was basically where we're at now. We are wrapping up our year of prototyping. So we're having um, a lot of like thinking back. So this was actually really well-timed um, for me. Uh, and then next year we're going into our, our, next, our next actual product that we'll be presenting to everyone that they can use. Um, if you would like to hear more or just ask me questions or say hello, any reasons, um, I am on Twitter. Um, here are a series of websites or you can email me. And thank you so much for listening. Hey, thank you so much for joining us, Cy. That was super fun. And you guys, if anybody ever gets a chance uh, to play uh, Job Simulator on VR, I highly recommend it. It's really fun. And Rick and Morty is also really great, but I'm a Job Simulator fan. Um, all right, Shelly and Kira, do you want to chat about what you're working on? Excellent. I can see your screen, but I can't hear you yet. You guys have your uh, mic. I think on. I finally unmuted myself. I originally shared. Uh, and didn't. <laughs> yeah, there we go. So I'm Shelly. I'm the director of Reframe History. I was a museum educator for seven years before moving over to public media, where I focus on toxic stress and its impact on middle schoolers, and then also focusing on Reframe History, which is a virtual African-American museum. Hello, my name is Kiera Vincent, and I am a friend and co-conspirator of Shelley Reeves. I am the self-entitled interactive specialist, where I am working on making sure that all of the products or projects that we're working on in Reframe History are going to be something that players can have a, an active participant role in. So that's kind of where I'm at this project. So Reframe History as a virtual African-American museum really focuses on keeping stories alive through archiving the past, recording the present, and advocating for a future that doesn't have gaps in our understanding of African-American people and the impact of African-American people. So essentially we are building a Black History app where you can hold up your phone to any location and it tells you Black History facts and our street corners become our galleries and everyday objects become our collection as we share history. And so before global pandemic, one of the projects we were working on was a in-person gallery experience. And so it was focused on the 50s and the 60s in Glenville, Cleveland, Ohio. And you would go into the space and had images and didactics and really took a deep dive into the 50s and the 60s from the point of view of five people who have lived in this neighborhood their entire lives. But then things got a little interesting. So at this point, COVID hits and the exhibition was originally supposed to open April 10th. So had to mourn that not opening and determine how to move forward. And originally not really moving forward, just kind of sitting and waiting. And then the protests and the death of George Floyd occurred. And there we really had an awakening of inequities of African American people throughout our country. And Kiera and I really took a moment and stepped back and thought about how can we make a difference in this moment. And we know that the issues that 
are present now were present before, even as people are becoming more aware of it. And so we kind of went back to the drawing board and thought about how do we decentralize the authority to share, archive, and collect history, which was one of our original goals when we started working together in 2018. And so that exhibition became a virtual exhibition called The Rise of Black Glenville, and you can access it through blackglenville.com. And many of the things that we began thinking about is when you go into a museum and you have these interactions or a gallery and have these interactions, how can we pivot and make them still engaging and virtual, although you might not be able to interact directly with people. So for deciding how to actually bring this to the people, that was where most of the work um, came in for brainstorming, where I had to like really ideate and brainstorm what can be used for the most, the lowest common denominator, because not everyone's going to have the gear for XR, VR, and not everyone may have a super high tech phone that allows them to do augmented reality. And maybe people just don't have a lot of data. And so that really, we had a lot of interesting design constraints that aren't normal because of the pandemic. So what that meant for us was trying to just find really kind of, not really low hanging fruit, but things that everyone could use from really young children to our older population. We want something that was quick, easy, and a low barrier to entry. So our first exploration was trying to use Twine, which I believe Sai had mentioned. And if you're not familiar with it, Twine is a way to do interactive or branching fiction. It's hosted on the internet. So if you have a phone, a tablet, a desktop, it's very uh, low bandwidth, very easy to log into and play without any knowledge of how to use technology. So very easy. But then we even scaled back from there because our narratives weren't going to be really branching. There wasn't going to be a choose your own adventure story in a sense where you take a character and take them through different obstacles. Instead, we realized it was more like an audio tour with these Glenville residents riding along with you as you explore the neighborhood. So then we scaled it back and went from Twine, which is somewhat of a game engine using um, a web browser, and instead just used a basic web page, which everyone or most people have familiarity with. So we took all of the clippings, audio clippings, digital clippings, and then put them into a web page that takes the user and brings them through the Glenville, the Glenville neighborhood as if they were walking or driving or any form of transportation with one of these residents. We found that this was very easy to do in regards of tech. However, the only issue that we had was getting people out to play. And these images, you can see that we have a couple of play testers who actually chose to get out of their car, which we really appreciated because it allowed them to interact and with the spaces in a different way, as opposed to being in your car, they can kind of tour the grounds, listen to the audios of these people and kind of almost walk in their footsteps. So we appreciated that some of our initial play testers took those extra steps. As we move forward in the future with the Reframe History app, we are still hoping to make it a native app, meaning that it's something that you can download onto your phone. However, as we're play testing over these next possibly couple of months, we're just gonna keep it on the web just to keep it able and accessible to all members of the Glenville community. Yeah, thank you. Um, and here are both of us. Excellent. Great. Thank you guys so much. So it was really, it was really fun to see that come together. So, all right. Fantastic. Well, last but not least, let's have Jessica Crane bring us home. Hello, folks. Um, again, my name is Jessica Crean, and I am a game designer and an immersive experience designer. Um, so as I mentioned before, I often do both of those things at the same time in what we call playable theater. So highly narrative experiences or experiences where players are maybe even taking on a role um, and really creating sort of elaborate worlds for our players to step into. And then giving them agency in that world to say, you're not just going to passively follow through with this experience. You get to make some serious choices to shape the way that this story is going to go or the way that your own 
own life is going to go after this. So, you know, nice light materials here. Uh, so I'm the founder and whatnot of a little studio called I Can't Go On Games and uh, Immersive Experiences, which I'll talk a little bit about our work as well as some of the larger trends that I see in the industry. So I just like to think of immersive as sort of something like this image here, which is uh, Alice going through the looking glass. And certainly there's plenty of Alice in Wonderland theater out there, but really it's this, this little thin veil that separates us in our reality from these fictional realities that we get to inhabit. So that's a space I occupy often and have since I was a little kid. So so in the before times, I was on a path like everybody else. I had a journey, I had a vision, you know, I started out as a theater kid and a risk taker. To be fair, I ended up in detention quite a bit as an elementary school student for like rabble rousing all of the girls into um, just like anti-patriarchal -pa kickball games and whatnot. Um, and so I ended up translating that into like a the uh, with the world of theater and working through working as an assistant director on and off Broadway and directing plays and trying to find ways to make theatrical experiences as much fun for the viewers as it was for those of us in the room doing all of this crazy collaborative problem solving, creative problem solving. And so that led me, you know, through this whole journey to game design and immersive theater, these worlds in which players were not just actors, but anyone who came into a space, which for me is the beauty of games, is that everyone's a player. Everyone has this ability to shape the world. So they end up being these sort of training grounds for reality in really exciting ways. And so as I'm progressing, you know, through my life, I started exploring really even more complex subject matter in my work, like climate change. I work with the National Park Service. Um, I have a museum, a, a pop-up museum of philosophy that I'll talk a little bit more about in another slide, exploring this idea of uncertainty and what we do when the world feels like it's being sort of like pulled out, the rug is being pulled out from under us. Um, and what is it like to feel isolation? And that last one ends up coming into to play quite a bit here in pandemic times as well. So here I am on this journey, like plotting out all of these things I'm going to do this year. And there's a lot of climate change work happening and I'm so excited. And it's just this land of bright, shiny future, of course, like all of us felt on January 1st of 2020. 2020. And then, of course, that all changed. And there's this kind of crash and burn feeling, right? Like, what am I doing? This is my work. My work looks like this. It looks like putting people into the same room and having them talk to each other and engage and take these little missions and, you know, like really have this sort of really shared experience. And, you know, I'm thinking back on everything I know about theater, like how people in the same theater, can their heart rates will sync up. And there are all of these really powerful things about really bringing people together in space. And then there's just the physical elements to it. So uh, this piece, let me jump back for a second here. This is a show called Chaos Theory that I performed live for about a year and a half. And so in this vein of exploring really complex, heady material, uh, it takes the math and the science of chaos theory and turns it into a series of games, fractal games, butterfly effect games, strange attractor games, as a way to help people contend with feelings of chaos in their own lives. So there's this gamification that gets wrapped up in a narrative and it's this really shared experience. And then this other piece that I'm looking at, that we're looking at here, is a piece that the, the company did um, that I wrote and designed called Know Thyself. And it is a, a pop-up museum of philosophy. And uh, audience members would come to this museum, and I would be their tour guide. And I would lead them through a tour of this museum where instead of reading plaques about uh, philosophy or philosophers, each exhibit was uh, a game. It was an interactive multiplayer game where players would actually play through these philosophies and see what it actually feels like to make decisions based on nihilism or uh, you know existentialism or a number of others and they were all female um, POC and non-gender conforming philosophers because you know the, the, the canon gets plenty of love so this was really an exploration of what else is out there in philosophy and how does it relate to you and your life we can't do that online not quite the same way. You know, I can't fill up a room full of strings and have people go through this kind of quandary, this metaphor for, for what it's like to, to untangle knotty problems. So I'm sitting there like the rest of us, like, hmm, are we doomed? Is theater doomed? Should we just not be doing this anymore? I'm staring into the abyss. Everybody's staring into the abyss. But no, we're not doomed. We're just, you know, zoomed. So it's limited but it's still possible. There are still things that we can do. So something like this ends up looking more like something like this, right? There are these one-to-one -one translations. So as a game designer, you know, I put my like game hat on. I'm like, all right, so what are the mechanics? What are people doing 
in that string piece and how do we create that doing in another realm? And so the simplest solution for us was just like, let's take a look at the whiteboard. What, it, what are Zoom's affordances? What are all of the possible things it can do for us? And then how could we use them to the best of our advantage? So it's really just this act of observation that came into play. And something like this, where we have people going on these little missions and doing these sort of joint um, explorations ends up looking something more like this, which is actually more communal than the original piece was. And so I, was, I continued to perform chaos theory via Zoom, rewriting the entire piece within you know, two weeks because the world was still chaotic. The physical piece came about because of the 2016 election. The world felt chaotic to me and I wanted to help, find, help folks find a way to like, embody and empowered, to feel, to feel empowered around chaos. And so uh, what I did was really write this, this Zoom piece with the same spirit and completely different text and all of the games got translated to Zoom. So there's that one-to-one -one translation that ended up being really useful to us. Um, I also found that these philosophy games that I was working on actually could be translated a little bit to Zoom. Uh, so this is a game that we were play I was playtesting recently called Paradigm Shift for Lemons. Uh, and it's all about how we experience the world of change and what is it like, uh, what does it take for us to actually think about the world dramatically differently? Than we currently think about it. So we're overdue for a number of paradigm shifts in this world, in my humble opinion. Um, and as it turns out, having this chat feature was all that we needed for this game to pop. The game had been functional in a live space, but it was better on Zoom. And so just not prejudging like what is possible and actually giving something a solid play test was I found to be just infinitely valuable in this space, to not say no before I've even tried something. And the other thing is moving in the direction of technology, of course, while I'm performing and trying to figure out like, what can I do with the things that are available to me? I started working on this other project that I had been working on for years that had been on the back burner and then was able to come to the forefront. Um, and this is a game called RNJ, which is a collaborative game between two strangers who play out the story of Romeo and Juliet over the course of five days, all via text message. And so again, it's this act of translation, right? Here's this old story playing out in a new way where players are literally cast as Romeo and Juliet and they meet for the first time on the first day, not knowing each other and having to develop some crazy intimacy. And the reason that we put this back on the front burner is that during the, the now times, we're lonely, right? A lot of us are a little bit lonely at least. And it's hard to break up the days, right? I'm sure you've all seen the memes. Like today is day day. Today is the day of days. Today is another day of the week. It is next day. It is this day. It's really hard to track these things. But if you know you're playing a five day game, there's something to help break that time up, to give it meaning and to give our lives in that space a little bit more meaning and a little bit more structure so that we can fully inhabit them a little bit more. So again, there are, there are just like these ways to make the space work. And so for this, you know, this is just RNJ in a nutshell here. You can see these are some player creations um, because they get to leave each other sort of love letters as they go along, even though they don't know each other. Um, but it's a really, it's a really like uh, Romeo and Juliet takes five days. The play takes place over five days. So is the game. And so there was no reason to change that now because actually a five day game is more, you can, we're going to have more success now than we would have at a time when folks are rushing around and might not have the time to devote to a totally strange new relationship. So there's also a, uh, a flip side of this, which is that a lot of immersive designers are moving away from higher technology or smart technology and moving back into the spaces that would be historical technology. There's this beautiful resurgence of phone games. And I know particularly for our generation, people hate talking on the phone. I've always felt like such a weirdo for loving phone calls. And now all of a sudden there's all of this theater that is phone based. And it's deeply relaxing, right? You don't have to put like worry about how you look. We don't have to contend with that uh, that sort of like over overly zoomified life where we're constantly being seen. There's just this way to kind of relax into a story. And so we're seeing this resurgence. They're cropping up all over the place and having really long runs in the immersive world, which is very exciting. We're also seeing a return to pen and paper. Um, I'm running. Or I'm not running. I'm playing through two pieces right now that are purely letter based, and so I'm just receiving letters. And it's lovely. And I'm not the only one. And I know that there are others out there in this shared experience. And that too is lovely. Like that creates this sense of possibility that we can still have these shared experiences. It's just not taking space. Uh, it's not taking place in space. It's taking place in our headspace. And so that space is connected and alive and knows that there are these connections that are happening. It's just a short sort of a shift of what space means for us now. 
And then of course there's the physical aspect has not gone away. Uh, folks who are determined to bring people physically out into the world can do it. There are uh, drive through and drive by theaters now out there. And so you can come and drive in and see shows from you know, the, the health and safety of your own car, or you can just go on this sort of promenade piece where normally you would be walking from space to space, but due to COVID times, you can drive from point to point and still have these little, um, little moments, these little bubbles of interactions that happen within that. So uh, where I see this going in the future is really just more of this, more of artists saying, these are the things that are available to me and I'm excited about these things. And this thing isn't yet available to me, I'm gonna make this thing. And I think we're gonna end up with an abundance of stuff. We're already seeing this, you know, lots of theater companies are coming up with their own platforms. And I think those are gonna get winnowed down. And some of those things will win out. And hopefully those who are making those things will make them accessible to others so that we can continue to grow as a community and not just as individuals or individual studios or companies. But speaking of those, this is me. Please find me on all of the things and thank you for listening. I think we are headed over to Q&A time. Yes, we are. I mean, it's a pretty quick Q&A time because, <laughs> because I'm a terrible moderator. I'm sorry, guys. You're just saying such interesting things. I couldn't stop you. Um, we properly have four minutes uh, to answer <laughs> any questions. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll ask the quick question then um, because I think this is always handy for museum people. Platforms, right? So when you're trying to build stuff, what do you think is a good platform to use? What have you found to be helpful? What have you not found to be helpful? Um, I saw Twine come up a couple times. Yeah, anything else? I'd add Miro to the list. I've been using Miro to play test. That's M-I-R-O. Um, I've been running oh, a right. game on it with um, my uh, collaborative partner, Nicholas Fortuno, called My Undying Futurism. And we've done the entire thing on Miro and it's worked out really well. It's just like sticky notes glorified. Um, nice. And RPGs, we've been doing a lot of RPGs, so role-playing games, and those can take place over the phone or over Zoom, and you have a lot of control over that space because it's theater of the mind. Nice, nice. I've been really obsessed with design or uh, um, uh, Google.io lately because it's just like, you know, just the charts, just to be able to create charts. And Google, I think, is really handy, especially for like escape room type stuff. Um, anybody else? Karmisha, what, you're, you're big into Google as, as well, right? Like Google Docs? I'm huge into Google Docs. Um, I think Google Forms is just a really low barrier of entry. So if you're just mm -hmm. starting out and just want to try something, you can create a whole sequence on Google Forms. And um, yeah, anyone who's just starting out, I'd recommend that too, mm -hmm. in addition to everything else. Amisha, do you have like some solid examples of Google Form games that people can hop into? Um, yes, I do. I can drop those in the chat. But literally, if you Google library escape room games, you're going to see a ton of those come up because that's a lot of, that's a platform a lot of libraries are using right now. Yeah, I know a lot of people use things like Kahoot um, or like these other, um, I don't know, they're, they're very designy kinds of platforms. I'm not wild about them because they tend to be very limited in what they let you do. Something like, you know, Google Forms is a little bit more open or Twine, right? Because it sort of lets you explore a little bit more. I also love Clue Keeper, uh, right? Clue Keeper is a really great location based. Yeah. Love Clue, Clue Keeper. Keeper. Yeah. And they have AR now too. So um, yeah, and, and Kiara, you built your platform just right off of Squarespace, right? Yes, we use Squarespace um, to just basically set up the different images of all of the residents and then patch in the audio. So it's very just like point and click through a, a web page that was very quickly put up because it was using Squarespace, which is meant to be really simple for new people into web development to be able to build. So yeah, it was extremely, we prototyped using Balsamic, um, which is just a wireframing, but we could have just used pen and papers. And then we use Squarespace, which is free to use, but not permanently if you want to host your site and get an actual domain. So that was relatively affordable, I would say. Yeah, yeah, I think that's another good place to start. Um, how about games, favorite Zoom games that you can play with friends? Any, any suggestions? I said Jackbox because, you know, that's sort of the lowest barrier to entry, right? Easy to download, easy to play. And I second that over the uh, Q&A on Whova. Jackbox is game patently stupid and drawful. Just so much fun. So many easy, cheap, silly laughs. I recommend it to everyone. 
Yeah. Board game arena, right? <laughs> you know, like it's not, it's not Zoom, but it's like, it's a good place to play board games with your friends. And, you know, there's been like a lot of D&D and a lot of board games. I mean, gosh, I think I've played a lot more games in the last eight months than I had previously. Yeah, I would say one of, oh, sorry. I would say one of my favorites was a, a summer camp that I helped a uh, counselor at that was all over Discord and Zoom because it was a live action role playing summer camp. Mm -hmm. And I feel like campers were sorted into houses. Campers had like a lot of free reign ability. There was a, like even Zoom school, which took place over the summer where the classes were like potions and hexes is very Harry Potter-esque. And I yeah. feel like a lot of the role-playing fun happened after classes where they could go off and explore different rooms and they would be like different Discord uh, channels. And then you could hop over to Zoom if you want to do visual or keep it audio or even keep it text. And I found that to be extremely immersive, um, mainly just because it felt like you were actually exploring a place. You had a lot of agency on your own. So and though both of those platforms are free um, and relatively quick to pick up. So I thought that was like one of the most fun interactive experiences I've played in the during the last couple of months. Yeah. Oh, you know what else I recently discovered is Gather.town. You guys seen that one? Ah, oh, love that platform. Oh, it's really cool. So um, it's like a Zoom, but you play an avatar rather than sort of your photograph. Um, and so you can sort of move around uh, this 2D like little uh, game world and talk to people when you sort of bump into them. Check it out. It's just gather.town. And I think it's free for up to up to 20 players. It's a great place to build uh, games. There's also um, a lot of game designers, a lot of tabletop game designers are releasing um, digital versions of their games for free. They're like, hey, yeah. here's our rules. Go forth. <laughs> Have fun and play. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And then there's also Tabletop Simulator, um, if you're a tabletop person, where you can get a lot of really well-known games that you can just, it's like $10. Um, it's on sale on Zoom or on, on Zoom, on Steam often. <laughs> um, so you can, yeah, if you do that, you have access to a ton of games and can make your own. And oddly yeah. enough, it's actually also available in VR. <laughs> so you can, if you yeah. happen to have a VR headset, you can go in there and play Tabletop Simulator. Fantastic. Yeah. All right. So am I correct in my estimation that we get kicked out at 2.30 or can we keep going? Nobody's yelled at us yet. Let's keep going. <laughs> You're at 2.30. Yeah. Oh, wait. Let's keep going. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. We're well, in trouble. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm tr uh, so apparently the, um, the, chat keeps, the chat keeps going, um, but, uh, but the, the session, yeah, yeah I, I've, been, I've been given strict, like we got to, and I, 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 was, I so don't want to cut this off. It's been such a great, <laughs> um, I well, really don't. People but. still post questions in the chat and then we just won't be on Zoom. Yeah. yeah so yeah, if I you still have questions, just put them in the, in the questions part of Hoover. And I think people yep. will still be up for answering as like within the next hour. Yep. yep absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. And also a uh, hashtag Nima what now will uh, we'll also be happy to fill things there. So, all right. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us. That was so much fun. And uh, yeah, and please send us questions.